All right, well, I'd like to introduce our next speaker now. Jennifer Ball will be presenting to us about her research, which covered using peer-reviewed articles in Ellicott's EAP classes. And Jenny works at the Australian Catholic University English Language Centre up in Brisbane. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you, Sophie. I'll just um, try and share my screen. Looking good. Okay, is that good now? That's great. I'll just get your um, pictures, move your pictures so we can see my notes. All right, so um, as Sophie said, my research was about um, encouraging EAP students to engage with the literature of their disciplines. In the past, I've worked in academic support programs in a number of universities, and I've seen that all students can struggle to manage the huge workload of their degrees. And this is, of course, magnified for students who are reading in their second language. In my experience, universities tend to offer good support to help students with writing, but there's often little support to help with reading. Working as an Ellicost teacher, I've seen that EAP programs usually offer limited opportunities for students to engage with authentic literature, like they will actually encounter in their future degrees. I'm particularly concerned um, that the a big feature of reading in a modern degree is that it's digital and that perhaps the reading skills learnt in early course may be insufficient for effective reading in a digital environment. We all know the benefits of using authentic materials in ESL classes. Created materials are different to real world reading and, and students might not be able to actually apply the skills they learn in that abstract form to real world tasks. I think this applies as much to an English for academic purposes class as it does for a general English class. An important type of authentic material for EAP class is peer reviewed articles. Reading an academic article is significantly different to reading an EAP textbook article. It's sometimes suggested that students are apprenticed into the ways of talking and writing in a specific discipline. And domestic students may already have a bit of a head start um, from taking that subject in high school, but ESL students have not had this exposure. Well, certainly not in English at least. So I asked the following research question. Can referencing software help EAP students develop the reading skills needed in a 21st century tertiary environment? By referencing software, I mean any software that facilitates creating and organizing a digital library. So many of you um, will be familiar with EndNote, for example. Most Australian universities give students free access to EndNote. Another popular one is Zotero. Uh, for this research, I chose Mendeley. So to help answer the research question, I asked the following sub-questions. What are teacher and student attitudes towards reading peer review articles in an EAP class? And what activities support the use of peer review articles in an EAP class? I conducted the research over 10 weeks of a direct entry online EAP program in a university in Brisbane. On completion of the program, students articulated into a range of 
under and postgraduate degrees. To answer uh, sub-question one, which was about student attitudes, in week two, I ran a Zoom poll asking students how difficult they found various academic reading activities, like mm, finding the main idea, for example. You can see from the pie chart that on a scale of difficulty from one to four, the vast majority of answers were at that easy end, one or two, and no students thought that any academic reading activity was impossible. However, in an open-ended question in the same poll, they seemed less positive with comments like this one. In hindsight, um, I think we would have to question the authenticity of um, an in-class Zoom poll for eliciting attitudes in Elikos. The students may have been just trying to select the right answer. Later in the course, I asked some volunteer tutors to watch individual students in breakout rooms. The students did a reading task and were asked to narrate what they were doing. And two points of confirming evidence came out of this. Firstly, students expressed concern that their reading was too slow, a comment that they'd also mentioned in the Zoom open-ended question. And secondly, weak technology skills negatively impacted some students' um, task success which I certainly was observing during the class. In week 10, I asked students to write a final reflection comparing textbook readings to reading academic articles from their disciplines. There were only four students present who were graduating and who completed this task, but all four of them said both kinds of reading were beneficial and two of the students indicated that their confidence in reading articles in particular had increased. To elicit teacher attitudes, I sent out a survey to um, the teachers in the, unit, in the language centre. They um, gave unanimous support uh, for the use of peer-reviewed articles in EAP courses, which did surprise me a little bit. Six of the seven teachers had in fact used peer review articles in Elikos classes in the past, and four of those had used articles from the students' own disciplines. The teachers also gave qualified support for using referencing software in EAP. But all of the teachers were experienced in using referencing software themselves, um, mostly EndNote, suggesting that it wouldn't be too difficult for them to use this software in their classes. There was a very strong emphasis on the need to scaffold reading and to teach specific reading skills. The teachers mentioned all the usual skills we teach in Elikos. This brings us back to the second part of the problem, that in their degree, students need to do all of these in a digital environment. Course content, textbooks, and academic articles are often delivered only in digital format. And on a student budget, it's just not feasible to print everything. My idea was that using referencing software would allow students to practice their reading skills in a digital environment. Obviously, these um, programs make it easy to add reference lists to essays, which is great. But for my research, I was more interested in using them to save and organize quantities of readings and to annotate individual files. So here you can see an example from our class. The students done some highlighting on an article they saved and added a sticky note. You can make groups in Mendeley. So we made a class group 
and then students could add their articles to our folder. All of the group can work on the same article or same file if you if you want to. And then um, if you click on any note in the file, you can see who um, added it. Actually, in the teacher survey, one of the teachers commented that this was something students could take to group work in their degrees. And it might be quite empowering to be able to show other students, which I thought was a, a really good comment. So the data for subquestion two um, was largely what I could see students were doing within our Mendeley class. I followed the usual action research cycle of planning, taking action, observing, and then adjusting practice. The plan for cycle one was to elicit attitudes of the students and teachers, as I've already discussed, and then for students to find readings from the compulsory units in their future degrees, and then to annotate those in Mendeley. After five weeks, no students had completed all of these steps. In fact, all of the students were at different stages of downloading and learning Mendeley. Very, very little article reading had taken place by this point. Thus far, the research appeared to be a fail. Clearly, a big adjustment to practice was needed. In the second cycle, some students left to join a face-to-face -face class and some new members joined our class. In response to the um, positive feedback from students, I allocated more class time to reading articles. However, clearly learning Mendeley was actually blocking this for some of the students. So we needed to start reading before everyone had learned Mendeley especially since we had now some brand new students in the class. As a class, we learned the SQ4R reading method. There are a few different variations of this method. Um, originally, it was the only 3R method, and sometimes the steps vary if you look it up online. But basically, the method steps students through a structured approach um, to reading. Once they were familiar with the idea, students worked at their own pace using a scaffold sheet to remind them of the steps. And Sophie can share a copy of the sheet with you if you're interested. When students were able to, they applied the SQ4 um, method with, of reading within Mendeley. While the class were reading individually, I took them one at a time into breakout rooms for help with their article. Mostly I was able to help them read their article despite not having read any of the articles myself by just relying on my generic understanding of research articles. So I could ask, for example, what did the researchers do? You know, and I knew where to um, find the answer to that quickly within the article. In the teacher surveys, it was clear that most teachers use similar approach when they support students with reading articles. But of course, non-research based articles, so I had students doing theology or literature, um, they were more difficult and time consuming for me to um, understand and, and therefore help the students to understand. During this time, I also worked um, with individual students or small groups to show them Mendeley. And the students were working through a Mendeley task sheet, which Sophie can also share with you. By week 10 end, um, all of the students had signed up to Mendeley online and downloaded the desktop software. All could highlight and add sticky notes to their articles. Eight students had joined our Mendeley class group and contributed to that. 
most of the students had also begun to use some of the tools for managing quantities of references, not just annotating individual references. So things such as searching across articles, tagging them um, and filing them into folders. Um, although it wasn't our focus, uh, four of the more advanced students had um, made a summary of an article in Word and they'd used Mendeley to insert their in-text referencing and a reference list at the end. So I was pretty happy with that result in the end. So in summary, um, teacher and student attitudes towards reading peer-reviewed articles in an EAP class were very positive. To support the use of peer-reviewed articles in an EAP class, scaffolded reading guides such as the SQ4R method allow students to work at their own pace on individualised literature. And if used in conjunction with the teaching of basic reading skills, referencing software can help EAP students develop the reading skills needed in a 21st century tertiary environment. In closing, I'd just like to flag um, two points that I think are worth further exploration. It's clear that being a digital native does not guarantee academic digital literacy skills. Uh, so I really um, saw a lot of the students struggling overall with their digital literacy. So it'd be interesting to do some, put some thought behind what are the specific skills required for academic digital literacy. Secondly, Ellicott EAP teachers are very familiar with and therefore comfortable teaching research genres. But how might we better support students to read other genres that might be important in their degrees? And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Jenny. Um, you know, your research raised so many insightful questions about reading in EAP courses. Um, and it was amazing watching you discover all of these questions along the way as well. If you have any questions for Jenny, please pop them into the Q&A. Jenny, there's a question from Virginia mm -hmm. and she's asked, do you think EndNote would be a good equivalent to use instead of Mendeley? Um, I think, yes, if I did it again, just because of the familiarity that the teachers already have with EndNote, mm -hmm. um, I might choose EndNote. My, my reluctance behind EndNote is that it is not free. It's free while you're at Australian University, but especially for international students who are, you know, maybe even if they go on to other academic careers or other study may not be in an Australian university, may not have it for free, and they can't just take their library with them from EndNote, um, where Mendeley and Zotero are free. So, um, you know, uh, I like that. And I think EndNote is a little bit more difficult to learn. Um, I don't know. I haven't tried to use it to learn it for a while, but I, yeah, I think it might be a little bit more difficult to learn. Um, so um, yeah, that was why I chose Mendeley. But yeah, I think that they all do the same things basically. And any one that you choose, I think it would then, even if students want to change, I think it would be quite easy for them to change. In fact, hmm. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Interesting. Virginia. Um, Virginia's asked a question which is a little bit tongue in cheek, but uh, uh, she's saying, "How did you not throw in the towel after your initial <laughs> failure with the students? You know, not." being able to pick up Mendeley as fast as you yes. had imagined and not getting into the reading until the second cycle of your research, um, there was certainly a huge, you know, element of perseverance with your research, I think. Yeah, and look, to be honest, it was because of the research. I think had I just been teaching, I would have just kind of hit survival mode and, um, you know, just tried to just sort of abandon Mendeley. But because I was doing that, it was that cycle of or that um, point of reflection that instead of just going ah 
ah, it's not working. I kind of took that step back and looked at it a bit more objectively and went, okay, all right, it's not working as I was doing it. And, um, you know, and, and, and therefore persevered. But also the students that had started, there were just a couple of, of students that had started and latched on to Mendeley and they really wanted to keep going. So, um, yeah, that also encouraged me to, to, to stick with it and, and keep going. <laughs> Mm. And it's just a great example of the, the flexibility of action research with the different cycles that you can go through where you can adapt your research questions or your intervention methods, uh, data collection methods as well. And I think you did that really well um, throughout your project. James has another question for you. Um, he's said... Did you have any discussions with any teachers in the higher ed subject areas about this approach? Do you think it would be worth getting their feedback on reading competency and some of the issues they've noticed? Mm. Uh, um, actually, I work myself in the higher ed <laughs> section yeah. as, as, you know, I work in that area as well. Um, but um, no, I didn't. Uh, I didn't specifically speak to them. I, what I would have most liked to speak to them about actually was um, their read to get their reading lists because I was looking mm. at, um, you know, not the specific reading lists but some of the um, possible readings that's just on the on the website. Um, but to 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 have honed down what some of the actual readings were that students could have gone off to their degrees and have already read some of their articles. I thought that would have been fabulous if I had the chance to speak. Unfortunately, the nature of higher ed is often people don't even know what they're teaching in the next semester. So yeah. it can make it a bit hard to find who's going to teach what. And mm. yeah. yeah. But okay. yeah, I, I think it would be great to do that actually. Mm, absolutely having access to that reading list would be yeah. very helpful or, or yeah just to talk in general to the teachers and see what they thought about the students um, maybe that's another action research project in there <laughs> yeah. for yeah. someone to take up yeah um, Elena has asked another question would this approach be impossible if there were some students in the class who didn't have a personal laptop or tablet um, that was most definitely one of our big problems, but that's part of what I think needs to be explored when we're looking at this whole issue of academic digital literacy, because mm. I, although it was definitely against our um, rules, lots of my students were on their phones all the time. Now, Mendeley did used to have a phone um, kind of app that went with it, but um, recently they dissolved that. So that made that a little bit more difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you. I think you do. I think you need a laptop. I don't think you can do academic writing on your phone. But actually, a lot of my students were trying to do that. So yeah, I mean, I can't imagine trying to read a, a journal article, a dense journal article on a phone. But then I don't know whether that's a generational thing because even when I've been on campus, sometimes I've taken students to the library for a change of scenery. Um, you know, and said, you know, you can go on the computers in the library or get some books and they sit outside the library and read on their phones. So interesting. I yeah, I could do it. But <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. Um, that was, uh, you know, amazing hearing about your insights. Um, and I do love the idea of training EAP students to read in a digital environment, um, because as you say, at university, it's very much a digital focus. So thank you. And thank you. to all of our attendees today, um, thank you for coming along and we hope to see you tomorrow and on Thursday. I've just popped a link in the chat now, which is a brochure which has summaries of all of this year's action research projects. So you'll see Malcolm and Jenny's projects in there and also summaries of the other projects from this year. So once again, I'd just like to thank Malcolm and Jenny and Professor Anne Burns for presenting today. Thank everybody for coming.